And we're live. Hello. Welcome to week 73 of Supercharged Fridays. I hope you guys are well wherever you are. Relatively safe, well, happy, sane. Uh, it's a sliding scale. So hopefully on the balanced side, as sane as can be in these crazy times that we are in. Um, I'm thinking of it like season two of COVID. Last year was season one. This is season two. Hope everyone's well. If you're watching us and you see us live right now, come in into the chats and say hi. Tell us which city you're in. Tell us what time it is. What's the weather like? What temperature is it outside? Um, and we'd love to have you uh, in, in, in the chat. So as you can see, I have a fellow career coach who's been at it for quite a while. Yeah, Matt, you started career coaching, what is it, like 12, 13 years ago? And a new friend of mine that I discovered through LinkedIn. So Matt, I can't wait to chat with you and a very warm welcome to Supercharge Fridays. Uh, thank you, Sanal. It's an honor to be here and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining in to, to see me talk about my life. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. We have a lot of ground to cover and I can't wait. So, uh, yeah, I mean, come in, in the guys, come in, in the comments, guys. We'd love to see you. And and Matt, talk to us about a little bit about your journey before I bombard you with questions, um, because you have a little bit of a different journey than the usual. So share, share with us what it's been like. Absolutely. Well, and I'll keep it kind of a macro level just to not go too deep right away. But uh, so essentially, you know, I was a, a, a young college kid kicking the kicking the tires, trying to figure out what to do with my business degree uh, back in the early 2000s and uh, had a friend kind of steer me towards recruiting. And at that point, I had no idea that what recruiting even was didn't even, you know, I had no idea what that world even entailed. And um, I am, you know, still friends with the friend who got me into it. And I still tell her, like, because of you, I am on my life's journey uh, doing this stuff. So um, I didn't think that was going to happen when I was, you know, 22 years old. But uh, so I got into HR recruiting or excuse me, I got into staffing recruiting, which is a whole different world. Um, and uh, from there, kind of went into some uh, internal HR recruiting work, which was a lot of fun. I actually enjoy that more than staffing. Staffing is a bit cutthroat. Uh, all you staffers out there, I, I applaud you. It is an emotional roller coaster that world. But uh, so then after the HR recruiting, um, I myself was a victim of the uh, 08 financial collapse. And uh, it forced me to kind of figure out what to do next. And so I decided I was going to start my own little shop uh, in 2009. And uh, after my layoff and uh, have been doing it ever since, been my small business owner ever since. And uh, tell you, I, I would hope to never go back just because it's not, you know, for me, I really enjoy what I'm doing. And so uh, as much as, you know, how, how dark it was at that time in my life after the layoff and kind of not knowing what I was going to do with the rest of my life, you know, now I look back and think, wow, that that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Exactly. Um and that is a very familiar journey that a lot of us are on right now. Um, something good coming out of something bad, right? Um, yes. And and it's great that you've taken lessons from there and and learned from there. So fantastic! I um, see uh, you guys coming in. I I love that you're already engaged. Very warm welcome to everyone watching. I see that we have a couple of questions in here already. So Ravindra and Sohail, hold your horses. I promise we'll get back to you because I want to get into a little bit of career stuff with Matt before we get to your questions. So hold on, but do type your, your question again a little bit towards um, uh, the second half of our, our broadcast today. And if you can, please remember to write the word question in capital letters so I make sure I don't miss it because sometimes there's comments and questions buried in the comments. So make, that is a great way to make sure I don't miss it. Um, and one of the reasons that Matt, I wanted you on today. So first of all, uh, definitely follow Matt and, and not just because, you know, he's a great guy and he's got a lot of great advice to share. Follow him on LinkedIn. Um, but the other reason as well is, is Matt, you um, did not touch upon it, but you had a bit of a brush with the world of movies and Dinseltown. 
um, which I know a lot of my friends watching in different parts of the world, whether you're in the US or India or anywhere in between. We have Hollywood, we have Bollywood. So a lot of times there is this fantasy. Oh man, this looks amazing. I'd love to be. So you actually did something about the fantasy. Like Matt, like as a career option, you looked at acting. Talk to us about that detour or you know or is it the main road are you going back there ever <laughs> there you go is it my feature role am i a day player um yeah so you know it's funny that when i do summarize my you know kind of where i am professionally i kind of always forget about that that's why you saw me go from hr to career coach but um yeah i so after school I wanted to be in advertising. I wanted to copyright. I wanted to make the Bud Light commercials. And that's 100% truth. I, I was a writer growing up. I was like that kid who submitted my short stories to contests when I was in fourth grade and that kind of thing. Um, and I just caught the bug early. So I've, I've always been a writer. And that's kind of funny why now when I resume write, I blend my business acumen with my writing. So it's kind of a perfect mesh. But before I wanted to be the creative writer, because I love creativity. Um, in fact, I'm since I turned 40 this year, I'm kind of trying to embed more creative outlets for myself. As you get older, you kind of don't, or when you're younger, you're like, I don't have to worry about, you know, work-life balance and balance. You're just kind of go, 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 go. And, and so as you get older, you start really realizing, wow, like going on a vacation does de-stress you, you know, doing creative outlets makes you feel better. So you kind of have to start really taking care of yourself more. Yes. Um, yes. And, you know, I, I just, you know, it's, it's amazing, but I'm still learning that. Um, but so I wanted to make commercials. I wanted to be a copywriter. And I knocked on so many doors after I graduated and had some interviews and just could not kind of crack that nut um, and get into advertising. So I ended up going into paper sales and before I got into HR, before I got into recruiting, staffing. And um, all the while in the background, I kind of gave up the advertising copywriting because I just I was putting together a portfolio and it just wasn't doing anything. So. I thought, well, you know what? I've always kind of made my friends laugh. I've, I was voted most likely to be on Saturday Night Live in eighth grade in my class. And I, I had made a comic strip in school when I was little, a comic book, and would distribute it to my friends. My dad would go to, to work and print the copies out. I still remember when I was in seventh and eighth grade. Um, so I've always wanted to create. And so I said, well, you know what? I always entertain people. I kind of grew up in a household of, of being funny. We had, I had three older siblings that are about 10 years plus older than me, the, the closest ones 10 years away. Um, so um, I've always kind of just had humor around our house. And so I said, well, you know what, I'm just going to start trying to, you know, make it in Hollywood, but not so much Hollywood, you know, what we call Hollywood, it just means making it in the movies. I was still in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, shout out not to exactly Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio, not, not exactly Hollywood, not exactly Hollywood. Right. We have, uh, you know, two comic joints that you could do stand up at. That's about it. Uh, back then. Um, so I actually started writing jokes. I took a comedy class, a stand up class and, um, was the coolest thing I ever did. And this was, uh, back in Oh five. And I took that and ran with it and started and actually what's funny is so after you graduate this comedy class they allow you to do a showcase at the improv which at the improv in the, in the states is like you know one of the biggest comedy names you know across the country there's improvs like you know tampa improv and you know la improv and there's all you know it's a brand so it was cleveland improv and that's actually where a, a handful of people like steve harvey started there the guy who does family feud he was he was born and raised in Cleveland, so his first joints, his first comedy was at the Cleveland Improv, as, as his first his first place, and uh, so it was a big deal, you know. And I was there, and I, I did my 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 set, and a lady was in the audience, and she's like, you know, you're really funny. She's like, I'm doing a short film, uh, a nonprofit. It was for the Cleveland Rape Center, which was you know very, you know, a very sensitive subject, but. She just said, you know, would you want to be in it? And I wasn't funny in this short. You know, the short was very serious. It was really nice. Um, but I just was like, okay, yeah. So all of a sudden I start, I did this one acting gig and I go, so this is acting? And I had never done theater. You know, I was always just playing sports in, in high school and grade school. Uh, I never really took it serious. But then as soon as I did that, I go, well, I might as well try to start doing this to figure out writing. Because at that point I switched gears in my head and I'm like, I want to write movies. 
I, I, this is what I want to, I want to start writing this stuff. And so I started taking acting classes and uh, did stand up and start hosting open mic nights in Cleveland at a bar um, across from our, uh, across from the Cleveland Cavaliers play um, every, every Wednesday night. And then um, together, I kind of went up this journey of like entertainment business. So I started doing improv classes and started making short films. That was when YouTube was just starting out. So I started putting stuff on YouTube. Um, I was actually, I, my first published post, my first published video was in 2006 on YouTube. And that was when like, no one was really using it for that stuff. Not that I went viral for anything. I wish now, but, um, and then it flashed forward to, and I'd done that for a few years and it flashed forward to 2007. And I told my wife, I said, we should move that Los Angeles. Let's go learn this business. And she wanted to do hair and makeup. And at the time she was a technical writer for a comp for a, a, a PNC bank. And uh, she said, yeah, well, I want to do hair and makeup. That's been her passion. She's like, I'll go learn out there. So I started putting seeds. I started planting seeds and putting together a plan to move to LA and managed to get two interviews. Uh, and it took about six, seven months. Cause you know, you're from Cleveland trying to move to Los Angeles. You know, people are, you know, it was in back then. Join, it was the, like, join the club. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and uh, managed to get two offers from BP and Johnson Controls, and I pitted those to get uh, against each other, and I landed. Johnson Controls gave me a higher rate and a relocation package, so I took the relo, the higher rate, and we packed up the car. My parents came and they packed up my wife's car, and we just left in the group of four, crossed the country, right down Route 66. And, and how did it go, Matt? How did it go? Because Ankit, I am with you. I have the exact same question. How difficult or easy is it to change in a new space where you know no, nobody and you don't have experience? You know, for me, it's more of nose of the grindstone approach. I don't think of it this high level of like, you know, oh my gosh, because I think that shuts people down. I think if you just really focus like very niche, like, okay, I want to go. Laser sharp. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and start uncovering layers of, of 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 learning. You know, you start researching little things. So for me, I just I start researching where where should I go and take classes. So I, you know, when I got out to LA, um, and from classes is where you network, and then you start building little projects with people together. And flash forward, you know, a couple of years out there, um, I had an agent because again, you just learn. How do you get an agent in acting? Okay, so I learned it, and, and for that was I sent out. I went, and got headshots, got a resume together that I put on, put together using a template online. Back then, I wasn't, you know, a resume writer that was working full time resume writing. So we all start somewhere, Matt. Yeah, uh, and actually, the industry resume is very easy for acting. If anybody needs help, just ping me. It's super easy. It's not anything. It's and a nice, a, a nice headshot as well. Nice headshot. You put them together. You staple them. This is back then when you got, <laughs> it was a digital. You staple yeah. them together. Uh, two staples, one on top, one on the bottom. And I submitted it. To <laughs> I like them. how specific you are. Yeah. Two staples, yes. Oh, two staples only. They don't want four. And um, I submitted it to like 200 agents. I mean, it cost me probably a thousand bucks in, in postage. Yeah. And one pinged me going, come in for an interview. And I was like, okay. One yeah. out of 200. Oh, yeah. That was it. I only had one that was yeah. like, yeah. and that's where I was like, wow. Um, and I still remember, which is another incident. I actually, are we allowed to go personal, personal? <laughs> you share what you want to share. Just, okay. it's, it's just, so, it's just us. Okay. Okay. So I'm driving home. It's my birthday weekend. I'm driving home from this agent and I just landed it and I landed the agent. I was like, calling my wife. I'm like, Jamie, I got an agent. This is unbelievable. We're on our way up to the moon. And I apparently in my, you know, haste. I cut somebody off or did something. The guy followed me to my apartment, <gasps> opened the door, and he cocked me twice in the face. And I was like, uh, and I go, what was that for? And he's like, don't cut me off. And I was like, and this is Los Angeles. And people, if you're not aware, Los Angeles, like, uh, let me just tell you what. New York has the rep of being bad, and Los Angeles is being, like, very friendly. It's completely opposite. New Yorkers will hold the doors for you and say, have a good day. They're in a hurry, but they're very pleasant. I mean, I've never had a bad experience in New York City. Los Angeles, when I lived out there, people are constantly, you know, Aww. jumping over each other and, and there's road rage incidents always out there. I mean, it's bad. So is that um, why you moved? Is that why you moved back? back? 
No, I oh, actually oh. moved back because we got I got laid off in 09 okay. and we just okay. financially after a couple months, my wife did too. And we thought we're not going to run out of money out here. We didn't know anybody. Um, and so you've done some movies. Can you share some names? Um, so anybody who wants to like check you out online can do so. Yeah, I got a list here. So that and actually this is the only gig I got in Los Angeles. That was a studio film, studio show or film, meaning one of the, you know, the studios put it out um, it was iCarly. I was an iCarly. Was my first gig. Um, uh, still paid I there. like I Carly. <laughs> I C -A -R, Car C A R L Y. That's right. It's on Nickelodeon. It was. Okay. And then um, moved out here and got a new agent, which she has. She, I'm still with her, and she is like my like. I'm super close with her because she's just such a great person, and she's finally on her up and up. She's got some good talent on her roster, but so she got me into Vampire Suck, which was with Ken Jeong. Um, he, he's an Asian actor that, um, he's got a show, he's on like a talent show. So one yeah, no, I think the name, the name sounds familiar. So, so Matt, what you're saying is you're still acting. Still acting, still getting gigs. Uh, I mean, excuse me, auditions, getting gigs is harder. The last gig yes. I had, I got was on Halloween Kills, um, which comes out this October. Um, but before that was like bad mom's Christmas, which was like a three year gap. So, or two or three year gap. So to get cast, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, like it's a huge deal. Cause it doesn't come often for me. Yeah, no, it's not. Um, it's not easy. You know, um, there's some questions here about your career and we're going to get, we're going to get to them in a second. Um, you know, when we decide, you know, I want to, I've been doing X, I want to try marketing, for example. There's going to be a hundred people who are going to try and talk us out of it. Why it's mm -hmm. not a good idea. But if someone says out loud, I want to get into acting, there's a thousand people who are going to say it's a bad idea. They don't want you to get hurt. They don't want you to get your heart broken. So I'm sure you had that as well, you know, from close family and friends who tried to talk you out of it. So it's exactly what Tegan is saying. Passion, resilience, purpose, mindset. I have a question about that because Paul um, is asking uh, two good questions. And Paul, your first question is about, um, there was a question about writing. And and Paul, we're going to get to that in a moment because we, I think, um, Matt, I'm going to be asking you later your favorite resume writing tips, but hopefully that will help Paul. It'll help you as well because we're going to, we're going to get there. But did you know that this was going to be your purpose when you were in the, in the weeds of things? No, you know, I am always kind of, I always feel like I have like somebody with me on my journeys. Like I'm like, I thrust myself in projects and I'm like, what am I doing? And then like all of a sudden I start kind of connecting with whatever thrusted me into it. So it's like, I, I'm, it's such a weird thing, but I'm, I've always done that. Like even when I'm, I actually produced a movie that got distributed um, and it cost me about 60 grand to do, but I wanted to write and make my own movie. And then I actually got it distributed, which is like the ultimate hard thing to do as an independent filmmaker. Um, but it's like, I've always just kind of like thought, okay, I'm going to make a movie. And then I just go on these journeys of like digging, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> digging around, trying to figure out just what to do to do that. So um, no, I mean, it, for me, it's always kind of been like, uh, you know, kind of blending my love for things as a kid into an adulthood of like, okay, how can I like kind of keep some of that passion going? Like for me, if I could be a pro golfer and a, and a Hollywood film director, yeah, I mean, I would rather do that than anything else in the world, but reality has to set in too, you know, pragmatism. So, you know, I'm always one that kind of leans on how can I do this stuff, but also have the reality of like paying bills and like, yeah. you know, doing stuff mm -hmm. like this where I resume write and career coach, which I love doing, but sometimes you get burned out from writing resumes, right? I mean, it's like anything you do. Like if you're an accountant, sometimes you just don't feel like doing tax and, you know, crunching numbers. So you kind of still feel that burnout like anything though. Even on, yeah. even when I've done acting stuff, you've had days where you're like sitting around like for 13 hours and you do like one, one little scene and then you're done for the day and you're like, man, that was a long day for like, you know, 20 minutes on set. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's anything. But yeah, I've always just kind of went at it 100%. You cannot do anything Huh. Less than 100%, no matter what is in life, but especially this is this is the number. If you want to be an actor, there's 2,000 headshots that get submitted to the casting director. The casting director will then ask for 200 auditions. Out of 2,000 people, 200 people 
will send audition tapes to them. Out of those 200, 20 will get sent to the director or the people in charge of, of the actual movie or show. Out of those 20, they'll bring in about, you know, or they might even bring in all 20 for the audition with the director or, or, or like people up front. Out of there, there's about two or three that actually go into these final second auditions. And out of those, you get one person who gets it and one they put on a veil. They call it a veil, meaning if this person can't do it, this person's ready. So out of 2000, you're the one who makes it. And that's why it's like for me to get, you know, two, four, five, six, I got about 10 things under my belt from studio films. I, that's, that's blessed. That's like, wow. That yeah, really, yeah, I know. The odds, right? the odds are insane. Uh, insane. 2000 uh, headshots that they receive, 200 are sent over to the movies and the movies are doing shortlisting. 20 get called for auditions out of the 20, two, maybe three maximum who go through final auditions. And then you're saying one is selected and one is a backup. That's um, and, you know, when we talk in corporate about networking, it's who you know, etc. You can do that. If, of course, you should do that in, 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 in the world of movies. But your odds are still very low. <laughs> Yeah. Because that's what I was thinking, like that in terms of like teaching you um, about uh, rejection, because as Paul says, you know, competing, um, it's very competitive, um, the, the the stuff that you're talking about. Right. And, and look at our life, look at our work, getting a client to, you know, because there's a ton of other good, you know, colleagues that we even know in the same circles we're in, but they pick us. Right. And it's like, that's you should feel very good when you land a client because it's like, hey, that take it, you know, take that like gold. I mean, it's there's a lot of people out there, and for them to select you, you must be doing something right, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Uh, totally understand that. Um, and I'm seeing a, a, a bunch of questions in here, and we're gonna what we're gonna do is I only have one more thing to ask Matt, and I'm gonna ask Matt in a little bit, uh, because I see there's a lot of hungry people who have uh, loads of questions, and I'm gonna try and address them with Matt as soon as possible so we don't keep you guys waiting. And if you're watching us live, it's great to have you here. And if you're watching us now, it's on the replay. You can put hashtag replay so we know you know you're 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 there. Um and I'm gonna get into it because there were questions in there that came up right at the beginning. Ravindra, hi. Two questions. How do you convince a panel for switching into another domain? And how do you make conversations interesting when the opposite panel is low and dead vibes? Okay, we'll start with the first one. Um, Matt, what do you think about how do you convince people that you're switching into another domain? Because I saw another question about why do you want to change careers? And I think that's very uh, related uh, as well. Matt, what do you think about that? Well, honestly, it's like, who are you trying to convince about what? You know, like, so I'm not sure how to approach that question as far as, you know, if I'm new at something, I just start brushing elbows with as many people as I can learning, but being honest and saying, you know, hey. Um, um, it's I'm Matt, it's an interview panel. So he's in an interview and they're asking, so what panel. makes you go? I'm, I'm also guessing there's a, an IT side of things because domains, right? So um, you want to, you were doing X now, you want to do Y. Why do you want to do Y? How would you yes. answer that? So I would say just make sure when you're convincing the other the other people on the other side of the table that you can actually bring the value that will do the job that they need and make their lives easier. But if you can point out just how you've done that before, it's at previous employers, let that shine through. You don't have to act like you're going to be the expert coming in 15 years doing this exact thing that they're hiring for. If you're someone who's a career changer, and you got in the room with the interviewers already, that, that you're already halfway there. Now it's a matter of, can you fit person, personality-wise? Can you actually be the person that they can train and groom to understand this business? So just go in with as much transfer like-minded stuff that you've done that relate to that role and let that shine through, but don't- Perfect, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanna repeat, Matt, what you just said, because I say this all the time on Supercharge Fridays. Ravindra, if you're sitting in the room, and please listen, everybody listen, because we get this question a lot. If you're sitting in the room, physically or virtually, it doesn't matter. It means they already think you can do the job. Mm -hmm. You have two things to do. Prove them right, and don't screw up. <laughs> <laughs> Well put. As simple <laughs> as that, as eloquent as that. And <laughs> and Matt, to the second question, you know, you're getting like really like nothing 
from the other side in terms of energy, no head nodding, nothing. Um, any any advice for Ravindra about that? Don't overthink it. it, it yeah. Do you and and some personalities in the hiring process they like to be very bestie. <laughs> yeah. Don't. Yeah. There's no control over what they're what they're thinking, doing, whatever. You you'd be surprised how many people that you think I've really bombed that, and then all of a sudden yeah. you're like, how did I get that? And then yeah. one's like, man, I nailed it. And then it's yeah. like, what happened? I didn't get that. So, hey, w- w- even when I'm auditioning, I've had it where it's a very stiff room, and somehow I've been able to get that part. So, don't worry about that stuff. Don't overthink any of that. Just keep doing you and keep getting yeah. those value offerings out on the table. Exactly. Exactly. Um, thank you for that. So hopefully, Ravindra, that helps you. Um, there's a salary negotiation related question. And you guys know I have a detailed videos, three videos on salary negotiation on the YouTube channel. So definitely watch it. And so, Hale, if they are not de- going to deviate from what they can offer you, they can't. Uh, at some point, you do need to know when to stop negotiating because, you know, sometimes it's public information. Their hands are tied. So I would I would say don't push your luck too hard that you lose goodwill that you have built for so long because they felt maybe it was too aggressive or, you know, something that didn't feel right. There is a very tiny chance, but there is a chance they'll rescind the offer. That's not what you want, my friend. <laughs> so, and I want to congratulate someone. Arun says he got an offer because of watching the videos. Arun, well done. Extremely um happy for you and and going back to what paul said so matt there's some like secret thing when it comes to resumes because we're all building resumes right now some of us have never done it or some of us are doing it after 20 years or we don't have budgets for a guy like matt to do our resume for us and what is your favorite tip that you don't see used enough when it comes to resume building Okay, so I'm going to go twofold here. First, from the high bird's eye level, when I was a recruiter and I was sifting through thousands of people over the 10 year of my career, um, you innately develop what we call the six second eye test. Yes. And it is real. And not all hire managers have it, but they kind of can kind of glean on it a little bit. But uh, as a recruiter, we, we it gets embedded. So when I see a resume, if I look at it visually and then start reading just bare bones content, and I'm like, this person did not, it's not passing the test because it doesn't look resume-esque. It's not playing the playing the game, so to speak. So if you choose to do it on your own, just know that there is going to be some sort of, uh, uh, there's going to be a test initially just based off the pure fact, does this thing look like it's been done professionally or at least ha- has been created with that in mind, the six second eye test. Now to pass that, it comes down to the visual appeal the content and the layout. And for me, just make sure you have the right layout so it sells you, it sells your brand and your unique selling proposition come out. And by that, I mean, have a nice summary that's short, con- condensed, and it talks about your value offerings and what makes you, you, and you unique for this role. Get into some hard skills that can include operational, technical aptitude, or methodologies. Get into accomplishment section and show them the top five wow things you've done that relate to that role or are bottom line driven, or are just really neat, neat and unique, like maybe you won an award, gave a presentation, whatever, we're featuring in the news, and then get in the experience section. That's your meat and potatoes. Keep it linear, brief, and then make sure you have those sentences, each starting off with a nice wow verb, action verb, make it matter of fact. Because of this, here was a success. Because of this, here was a success. Everything's operational minded. Reduced waste, drove revenue, acquired clients, cut costs, whatever okay. you did. Okay, listen, it, right? um, a lot of people who are listening today, please, please watch the replay. I'm not going to be able to summarize because Matt has stuffed so much value in like three minutes. Um, but very briefly, what I want to say, and Matt, what you said, there's many recruiters out there who bash the six second rule, Matt, because they say it does not true. They are right. However, that is the six second rule applies the larger the company is because the larger the company is they're hiring hundreds of people a month yeah so they do not have time to read a uh, beautiful floral cover letters and resumes top bottom psh, done six seconds is the word average sometimes it's three so you want to be able to pass it and how do you pass it uh the visual 
the content, the layout. And Matt has gone deep into each of these visual content layouts. So do watch the replay to understand what he's talking about. And I want to add to that. Um, some people, including my clients, you know, they're like, I'll leave the good stuff for later. There is no later. Like, put it on top. <laughs> you get one chance. You get one chance to make a great impression. Make it count. Make the summary count and, and make it attractive so you pass the six-second rule. Fantastic. And uh, Matt, this was part one of your answer? Or was there some? <laughs> did you have something else? <laughs> no, but, you know, it, it's amazing. After you get that initial pass of the six second eye test, then they'll take a, maybe a minute to really see if there's someone that they could pass on to the hiring manager. But yeah, you're right. Thousands and thousands of, of openings th across, you know, I mean, there's a lot of activity constantly as recruiters. Yeah. We don't yeah. have time to marinate on every resume or I would not be getting my job done no. for my client. Hire no, I mean, recruiters are people just like you. HR are people just like you. And, and if they are external recruiters and agency staffing people, they are paid per position. They pay their, like they're putting food on the table because of that. So they do not have time, you know, get up in the morning, have their morning cup of coffee and read your resume like they're reading a book. It doesn't right. work. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> and if they work. don't have the resumes, then they're going and searching for them, which, you know, I mean, they, they're busy minded people. Exactly, exactly. So perfect. And Senyam is asking, okay, it's been a month since HR called me to inform me that you're shortlisted, but there's still, you know, I'm he's waiting. Matt, this has happened so many times. It happens in the world of acting, it happens in corporate, it happens, I'm sure it's happened to you, to me. What do you say to him? So first off, if it's been a month, I'd be comfortable with with following up if you have a recruiting contact there. Um uh and but again, you don't want to bug people. But here's the deal. Whenever there's hiring, it's not because of maybe you, Mr. Sharma, is the issue. The problem is maybe the hire manager all of a sudden took on three or more, three more projects and they just can't quite get to this part or the budgeting all of a sudden is being adjusted or they're, they're not even considering maybe not even opening the role as bad as that sounds. Sometimes they're like, maybe we don't need this. So you really got to know that when I was working that when I was working inside HR, it's not so much the candidate. It's more of what we have going on and our issues or whatever we're trying to get to. So when I was dealing with hire managers, every time I would try to sit down with them for, for to review resumes, sometimes they would cancel those meetings. Sometimes they'd say, bring it in, but only bring in a few resumes or, you know, things would get changed on the go because they are so worried about their operational stuff that hiring is sometimes a burden for them, yeah. um, but they know they need to get to it. So but a month, I would say you could follow up. That I'd be comfortable with four weeks. I mean, you're not going to be bugging them following up four weeks later. I would, I would definitely agree. And and say name, I would even say, why, why did you wait this long? There's nothing wrong with even one week. Yeah, a couple so, weeks. Yeah. What did they say? Because you got to end it in a certain way, right? You have to make the ask. So what are the next steps? Am I in? What What do you need from me? So if it's sort of left in the open, there's also an assumption that you're not you're not in, but you want to confirm that you're not in. So you can move on with your life. But I wouldn't hold my breath here. Ask them. And at the same time, have other options. you got to have other options. You can't keep waiting. So yep, keep good. Um, Matt, we're inundated with lots of questions. We're going to go a little bit quicker. Um, there's a question here from Jerry. My employer asked me to travel during the pandemic. Um, and that too, it was his personal work. I denied it. He's taking revenge. He told HR. Oh my God. Um, I'm going to address this very quickly before we move on to the next one. Jerry, this sounds, this is the meaning of the word toxic here. I'm honestly, uh, if you respect yourself, Jerry, and I know it's very easy for me to say it, but um, you know, we've all learned a lot from toxic experiences and bosses. Keep your eyes out contact recruiters, uh, get the heck out. I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 your self-respect is being denied there. So it's very difficult to, um, you know, respect a boss who is not a good human being, you know? Yeah. Um, and Ankit, how difficult is it to change? Oh, yeah, we, we addressed this already. Fantastic. Um, and Jerry, we also addressed, why do you want to leave? Um because we, we uh, did we talk about it? Yeah. Why do you want to, why do you want to leave the, um, this organization? Because no one will believe. You're, how far do you go in terms of honesty, Matt? So, it, it, so is he saying if you are, if the recruiter asks why you want to leave your current role for the new role? Your current organization for the new organization. 
Yeah. <laughs> so it's funny. I, you know, I just had a, a interview session yesterday with a, with a girl that we had, were talking about this answer. But, you know, essentially, honesty is key. If you are angry about the old manager or something about the toxicity of the old environment, do not go into minor details. Just keep it very high level. Like, OK, maybe there's no succession plan there in place. Maybe the change of management altered your change of duties in your day to day. And because of that, you're not as comfortable performing what you had initially signed up for. You know, so whatever your case is, it's case by case. I get it. But the less bashing, try not to talk about how you're just, uh, you know, you don't like the manager anymore or whatever. Try to really get it honed in from this kind of high level where it sounds agreeable about uh, across all parties. Like the new company gets it. That sounds that sounds just and they can move on because this is one of those little catchy questions that does not need to be over elaborated. They just want to make sure you're not going to be leaving them after yeah. you get hired. So exactly. short, swim, simple, and as honest as you can. As honest as you can. And and Jerry, I would also recommend I'm, I'm a quick shout out to Tegan. Tegan and I were live last Friday and this question came up on honesty as well. You got to be smart about it as well and not lay all your cards um, because some things can be held um, against you. So you, you definitely... Uh, don't want to do something to jeopardize your own chances. Um, and then I saw a question from Jay Wanth. Is it necessary to change careers to go to the next level? I have the capability. Can I go for a career change? Is that needed to move to level up, Matt? All situational. I'd like to know more. Like, it, yeah. it puts, you know, um, it's kind of... Yeah, Jay Wan's yeah. short answer, no, it's not necessary. It depends what you want. Depends what you want. Yeah. Um, it, it sounds almost like if you're trying to go to the next level, though, and you're going to switch in careers, you got to start at the bottom. So because yeah. if you don't know exactly. what the next career is, you're going to have to start at the bottom. Yeah, and you gotta you got to have uh, uh, learn as well. So, Praneet, this is the answer to your question as well. So we're going to take a couple more questions, and I'm going to ask uh, Matt something else. Anirudh is asking, my career got stuck and salary increased by only 20% in the last, oh, six years. Um, and I used to get more increases, uh, and I'm at a pretty good company. What do I do? Be patient right now with uh, the uncertainty of the post-pandemic. I think a lot of people are kind of still figuring out just what we're doing with with yeah. everything. So just yeah. hang tight and don't don't think it's you. I think it's just companies are still trying to figure out things. Um, <laughs> that's true. And at the same time, if it really bothers you, I would not. I would, I would I would say no problem just ask what are the next steps what what is it that you need to do to move to the next level because when you move to the next level it comes with more money as well right yeah, talk to your um, manager talk to your manager have a conversation about it and yeah. um, you know you'll get some answers so fantastic so anise is asking in the future do you have any plans <laughs> to create a movie on like your life journey <laughs> no, I made a movie and it was the hardest thing I ever did, and I'm never doing it again. <laughs> you said the one where you invested your own money in it, and you know, sixty grand and counting. No, that's you know, a lot of money. That's a lot of money when you're an independent, uh, <laughs> independently <laughs> produced, right? Yeah, it, it was. And and when I made the movie, we call it principal photography, which is when you're shooting with the camera and you are done. That only cost me eleven grand. It's cost me fifty thousand dollars in post production to get it. To where now you can watch it on Amazon and Netflix and you know or not Netflix but um uh you can buy it at Walmart on DVDs that kind of thing. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, and and horrible question here, Raj. I'm so sorry. Why are company HRs behaving like monsters when they're hiring and firing well, people? They're not. It's because when we go to hire, they got to sort. They got to talk to the manager what they want. They got to source the people, vet them, interview them, background checks, reference checks, drug tests onboard train and then hope the person lasts and it's long and expensive for everybody and if you're not the right fit they got to go do it all over again and so they got to do it all over again and raj it's a uh, not everyone's a monster in hr you may have come across a bad uh, bunch of them you may be hearing a lot of people bashing recruiters and hiring managers not everyone's like that no, not all the no, good and, and, and katra Chita, not everyone holds it against you if you're nervous in an interview it's like driving my gosh you're driving on the street and I see in front of me, it says L, learner, and I'm honking because I need to go and the guy is going at 20 kilometers an hour. I'm honking like crazy. I'm not a nice person. Does that mean all everyone is, you know, impatient? We all know what it used to be like. We all have been nervous. We yeah. all have been nervous. So if they don't have that empathy, that doesn't mean all HR is <laughs> like that. You may have come across um, a few, unfortunately, not very nice ones. 
Yeah. Um, Matt, I want to ask you because I'm I'm going to share my screen in a second um, while you're speaking. So Matt has a record number of recommendations on his LinkedIn profile. It's like over 700. Um, and talk to us about how you did this. How long have you been at it? And your best tips for us when we are reaching out to someone. Yeah. So for me, it's been the follow up is key. So what I do is once I yes. get done with my clients and you got to execute on your work, right? So yes. I do good work. I, I, I know I do good work because I get people hired, but it's like, if they say to me, this is great, or I got hired or whatever, I say, oh, cool. Can you do this for me? A little recommendation. And if they forget or don't do it, I follow up with them. So it's just yes. constantly not nagging, but knowing the distance of when to follow up. So that's, it's not a big secret. It's just, it's worked for me. And I'm, I tell them, this is kind of my lifeline for telling, for trying to secure other clients is these recommendations. So I'm up to 746 as of yesterday. I got a new one yesterday. Okay. Now guys, look at this. Um, this is Matt's LinkedIn profile. 747. Oh, 747. Yeah. oh and Delamo. Yeah. I forgot that was yesterday. It's another one. Yesterday. Now listen, uh, I'm going to um, vent here. So first of all, I want to recap what um, Matt just said. You got to follow up. You ask somebody once, do not assume they have nothing better to do. You've got to follow up with them. Um, and you got to do it nicely. You got to remind people. If you know you've done a good job and you deserve it, right? Um, now I'm going to vent for half a second here. Um, the proof is in the pudding. You got 747. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. I saw a post a few weeks ago by someone who said, what is this thing about asking for recommendations? Um, because every time, you, and I'm going to show it, every time you, you see someone's um, uh, profile and you see the recommendations on there, what happens is you have to click on show more and then you go down. Can you see my screen, Matt? I can, yes. And then you... Again, you can't see more. You have to keep clicking on show more, show more. And then you've got to keep clicking on. It's ridiculous. Uh, there is no need. And you should have 15, 20 max. And I thought, when we are on Amazon <laughs> and we're buying something, <laughs> and something has a 15,000 five-star reviews, it means something. And if we sure. can do our homework for an inanimate object, you think people are not doing their homework when they're purchasing your services, whether hiring you as an employee or as a, you know, as a, a prospect uh, client. So don't listen to people who say, and yes, I, I, I agree that you need quality. You also need quantity. You need both. You need mm -hmm. both. So, so don't listen to people who say you don't need too many the right people will be reading it. So if a person has more than 700 testimonials on LinkedIn, first of all, I think there might be a record. I don't know if anybody has that many. Uh, it's worth spending time on it and getting it right. Absolutely. I, I cannot agree more, especially, I, I say LinkedIn should have its own little recommendation page for us so we can actually post that as a <laughs> well, link. People like, dude, people like, you need, people like you need a page, okay? Like not yeah. all of us need a page. <laughs> You know, and that's the whole thing is like with reviews. Okay, so am I going to tell them don't do more than fifteen Google or Yelp reviews about my service? Like, hey, don't don't give me any more street cred. Uh, no, I mean, preach on, talk about me, toot my horn, and give me the feather of my cap. That's that's why I, I generate business stills because people exactly want to see exactly what you you follow up uh, and and like Lauren said, you just show up. I mean, you you uh, keep asking them. That's your brag file. That's the um, so so guys it can't be stressed enough. You're watching us right now. Make that list of 10, 15 people that you know you can reach out to. You know they've got good things to say about you. You don't have a doubt. Why do you not have a doubt? Because they've already said it to your face. If they've said it to your face, ask them to write it down. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, yeah. like Beyonce says, put a ring on it. In this case, tell them to type it. <laughs> yeah, and if they need a little help, tell them. Say, well, I was just thinking something along the lines of, you know, how my hard skills helped us with that project or exactly. how I'm, exactly. you know, good at communication with everybody in the department or, you know, whatever, just like whatever you can kind of tee it up to help them a little bit too to start. Exactly, exactly. Perfect. Okay, um, we got a few more minutes to go and we have a ton of questions in here. So I'm gonna um, get in there really, really fast. 
if you see something, Matt, that you want to answer and you want, feel free to take the name um, of the person. Okay. Uh, okay. Shelja, we just, sorry, we just answered this question. So we're not going to be going into it. So do watch the replay. Maybe if you joined us uh, later. Uh, I think we have a student here, Anjali. I've completed my BBA, Bachelor's in Business Administration. I don't have work experience. I'm planning to do an MBA in finance from the UK. So my question, the question is, I will search for entry-level jobs. What's the question, Anjali? We're going to be running through this. Is it a good decision? Ah, <laughs> she's giving us her plans. Uh, probably 21, 22 years old. Matt, mm -hmm. what would you say to you? your 21, 22 year old self with such similar plans? Sure. So uh, obviously continue education is always, always a, a, a plus. I mean, I, I wouldn't say don't get your MBA, but I would say as you're kind of embarking on the next chapter of your educational journey, try to find some internships or do some things that might be experiential learning based where you can offer, I know it stinks and everyone still is the, the big, like, do we get, do we do free work as interns? I had to do it you should be doing it kids in the world because that's how i cut my teeth and learned how my how to do my business acumen and how you network with people that might help you later on i mean i, I worked uh three different interns for free for these summers and i was like it's what you do i mean you know and, and then you offset it with maybe some retail job or something depending on how much you can balance just to get some um yeah, yeah i mean i would be pounding the pavement trying to get some hands-on experience while you're embarking on the mba just so you can have something other than the project work you're going to be doing in school. But also, while you're in school, start tracking the neat buzzwords you're learning, the neat topics, what they mean in the world of whatever you're getting into. I think it was finance, whatever. But, you know, learn what these things, how they're applied in real life. So then when you yeah. write your resume, you can use words like gain knowledge of or acquired uh, acquired information on things yeah. like that to kind of add those words into the resume then. Yeah, perfect. Hopefully that helps you, Anjali. And I'm going to add to that. There is no wrong. There is no wrong decision right now. You've got to get in. You got to get. And I, I, I think that you were here last week as well. Don't overthink it. You got to pick one and do it. <laughs> get, at it get at it. And you'll stumble. Along. It. You're not supposed to know. You're 20 years from now what you're going to be doing. Just start do going. Some of us are in our 40s. We still don't know. We're figuring things out. Yeah. So do not look at uh, like <laughs> others who look like they have their, you know, what together. <laughs> or, we don't. Okay? No. <laughs> No. <laughs> um, Someone is asking about the famous fabled ATS applicant tracking system. Um, Matt, your quickest, sharpest tip for the ATS. You you do need to play it, and it exists, and it's going to be heavy on buzzwords because recruiters, as a recruiter, you had to go and find people, and you use these words from the job description. Use the job description to your advantage. That's what recruiters are using. Most of them don't exist in the world you do. They're just there to recruit for that world. So they're using that job description like gold to find people. So make sure you embed that resume with those keywords. If it's honest, don't fib. Uh, and uh, make sure you don't have any borders, graphs, uh, pictures, all that stuff, because that can weigh down the, the ATS when it tries to copy the information. Exactly. And some you'll find you'll find templates online to so download those templates. But remember, you're making your resume for a human being. It's not for like bots and and, and uh, applicant tracking. At the end of the day, it's being read by a human being. So you don't want very heavy buzzwords in there and keywords. Keep it balanced. Keep it um, exactly. Um, perfect. And um, Shelja, we've got a lot of questions in career change. So we, we went on it earlier in the in the broadcast so definitely if you can watch the replay lise hello are there any chances of people being rejected for their looks I, Ooh. I, i'm what, sure it exists, <laughs> sure it exists. <laughs> they will not admit it because there's a lawsuit waiting yep. for them if they admit it but but what's your like it it's it's possible lise you want to be presentable uh and i once interviewed someone who how do I say this politely? Someone told me about her appearance. It wasn't her looks, like physical looks. It was her appearance and the way she turned out. Um, and I said, why is that important? Would would we have said that if, if this was a guy? So everyone kept quiet. So there's maybe sexism in there. Be careful. But the reason I bring this up is because I remember Matt. She, there's no polite way of saying it. She looked like she was homeless. Oh, and man. it turned out it was just her way of expressing herself. She Did she get the job? She didn't get the job. Um, so you want to be dressed the way you would be dressed at work. I'm not saying this was a suited, booted company, but you know the basics, right? I mean, yeah. look, 
brushed your hair, washed your face, clean shirt. Um, and beyond that, if there, you know, if there's elements of racism, sexism, you can't help it. No, they're not your, they're not your people. Move on. No. And I once had a guy show up to an interview wearing a uh, Italian necklace, a little horn with a leather <laughs> pants, leather pants. And his, and his shirt was open all the way down. You're to talking here. to me. You're talking to me. they hired him because they were that desperate. And my, my manager <laughs> goes, did you not tell him about what the clothing he should wear in the interview? I go, I thought we all kind of knew that we should all just uh, wear something common like sense this. Is not, common sense is not that common, clearly. No. <laughs> no, that's uh, understandable. But he got hired. <laughs> he got hired. So, well, you know, that's an exception. That's <laughs> so, an exception at all. Exactly. They, they were desperate, right? Most and companies. This, guy, they, this was my unicorn of my entire recruiting career. <laughs> he was the one guy that I couldn't believe I found, and I did. So, trust me, it was because yeah. he had skills that they didn't care about. His looks yeah, and, and it also means that they cared about his skills more than his appearance, mm -hmm. um, which is actually which I which I respect. So, mm -hmm. hey, Vidya, Vidya has a question in terms of how can startups make their employees feel valued when they're still early in the early stages and face dozens of new challenges every single day? Hmm. That's interesting. I've never really been involved with a startup, so I'd probably opt for you to answer this. I really... I I've been in a couple of startups. I think, Vidya, um, just treat them like human beings and individuals. I would just say, you know, not call them talent and human capital but when you are a startup you have no excuses to forget names so just treat them like human beings you know small things go a long way remembering birthdays remembering how hard they work that kid has a violin recital let them let them be because you're going to grow you're going to expand it's going to get harder but in the early stages the way you treat people it sets the stage for how you will be treating people a little bit later as well. It's a bit simplistic, but not necessarily right. our focus for discussion. So hopefully uh, that helps as well. And Dhirendra, we got this question earlier as well. Um, there's a lot of flooding in terms of applications and you know people do the best they can, right? Yeah. Um, and then there's a question here from Naveen. What's the extent of sharing your ideas and strategies with the hiring team at the interview stage? We only see the tip of the iceberg as an outsider, and yet we're not part of the system for a fool, uh, for a, a foolproof answer. What is the ex so? How much do you share? How much do you give away? It's early. I see. I'm all for if you can understand what you can do to help that position and remove those pain points as to why it's open and make their life easier if they hired you, preach on. Because that might be like your one and done chance. It doesn't, if yeah. you hide anything, it, they might hire the next person who went all in. So I've yeah. actually seen people have success literally putting together plans and bringing them in saying, here's how I would fix all your broken links as the SEO manager and yeah. put together a, a whole plan for it. And, and that stuff wows people. Yeah, no, exactly. I think Naveen, um, to answer your question, I, I have a business coach who, who mentioned to me because as entrepreneurs, particularly online, you have something which is called an opt-in, which is a free resource. And I have a few free resources online. Um, Matt has free resources online. And by the way, in case I forget, if you want to know more about Matt, definitely check out her website. Um, I'm guessing M and W are your first name and last name. Uh, Matt Warzel. What is J? Is that like an embarrassing middle name? <laughs> no, no. That's my middle name's Robert. That's actually my wife. When I first started, oh, we were going to so, be doing it together. <laughs> so sweet. Yeah, I was, I was thinking like you know sometimes you know you'll be like this. There'll be like a very manly guy, and then the middle name is like Evelyn. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, she still jokes about it. She's like. Do you we removed the J. Like, it's like I was no, like, is that wrong. Janice? Like, is that like yeah. your middle fame? You know, Maybe I can get those so, uh, so definitely like. check out like Matt's uh, website if you want to know more information. And why am I talking about it? Yes. So, um, what I was told was by the coach, your free stuff has to be better than your paid stuff because if people don't like the free stuff, why will they come and hire you? For the right. paid stuff. So if your advice that you're sharing or knowledge you're sharing in interviews, give it. Don't hold on to it. Don't have that scarcity mindset. If they love you, they'll call you back. Yes. And don't think about things like um, stealing, etc. Um, fantastic. So great to ha help you, Himanshu, with your LinkedIn recommendations. It's not easy. We're not saying go for 700 tomorrow. It's Matt, it's taken you what? Years. Oh, <laughs> decades. Uh, nine years. Nine years, nine years, which is which is still like, yeah. I started this in 09, but I didn't start doing recommendations till 12. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Anis, we're not exactly the best people to talk about moving from corporate jobs to startup founder. We'll sort of skip your question for now because we're looking at sort of career um, analogies in here. Then Mayur Rakshi. Hi, given the COVID situation, is it okay to take up an offer from a startup? A lot of startup questions here. So it's yeah. telling me something that there, there's some hiring going on. Yeah. Better money and designation or an established organization which has less pay, lower title compared to the startup. That's that risk factor. How much risk are you willing to take? And uh, is it going to be more room for growth at the established organization, knowing that they have probably succession plans in place versus a startup that might not exist in a year? So, I mean, that's how much risk you want to take. And what what you, I would say more of what your feeling is versus the much research that you're going to do. It's more of a feeling at that point. Uh, it's definitely instincts. And and my, Rakshi, my favorite advice would be go for the role, the meaty the meaty role for growth and learning and not so much about the company. Companies yeah, come and go, go, but the role is what you'll be learning from. And also don't forget the role of the manager here. Um, did you get a good feeling from the manager? Though sure. that chemistry is very important because in your early stages in your own career, that can make or break you. Mm -hmm. Vineet, you can definitely ask for recommendations after you've left the company. Matt, what do you think? Absolutely. Just ping them and, and be polite mm -hmm. about your kind of coming in two years later saying, hey, I know this is out of the blue, but, you know, and, and just kind mm -hmm. of be very kind of pleasant and, and engaged at up front and tell them, hey, yeah. OK, this is my real. This is really why I'm coming at you because I need a recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Just be nice about it at first. Be like, How you doing? What's going on? And see if they respond back. Then say, hey, I was just thinking, would it be OK if you did this for me? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and most people will say, yeah, no problem. Sure. Um, and Anupriya, is there any chance of rescinding the offer after negotiation? So Anu, could you please clarify, is it you or is it them? Because we already talked about them. And yes, there's always a chance that somebody might rescind the offer. Um, you never know. There's no guarantees in life. But Anu, could you clarify, you're talking about you changing your mind? Because if you're changing your mind after signing, they are not going to love you. And yeah. bad news spreads fast. Yeah, I could 100% agree with that. I've had that experience with BP. <laughs> they didn't like when I turned them down after they already offered it. But I had, I mean, I got a better gig at John's Controls. I'm glad I did. John's Controls was awesome. Yeah, I've heard good things about the company. Um, Matt, what do you do with egoistical seniors? Good Lord. This is the book people should write. <laughs> you know, it's funny. The only one I can really think of, and I didn't have too many of them in my career back when I was employed nine to five kind of thing. But I do remember one that just would hate having to meet with me as a recruiter. And what I did was very matter of fact. Here hmm. are the data. Here's what we need to accomplish. We're just trying to get a job done together. I'm not trying to be friends with you. You don't say this. You just tell them, here's what we got to do. Let's get it done. Other than that, though, let them just be and just don't let it, don't let them bring you down. Yeah, no, absolutely. A hundred percent. You've got to do what you've got to do. And and we're coming close to the end. We have another minute uh, to go. Um, and I know if you haven't signed, that's fine. You always have a right to change your mind. Um, and LinkedIn user between aerospace and marine automation, pick one. We just said it earlier. Pick one. You can't go wrong. <laughs> You'll never know till you pick one. Mm -hmm. um, okay, a few seconds in here, but I'm going to have to stop because it's not fair. We've kept Matt for nearly an hour. We've been live. So if you want to know more about Matt, definitely check out his website, mjwcareers.com. Give him a follow on LinkedIn. He posts a lot of useful things on, on LinkedIn. But uh, Matt, you're also live uh, once a week on Facebook, I believe. Actually, twice we Tuesdays on Facebook on my group on my group, and then uh, Wednesdays on the LinkedIn uh, event page. So if you need to, just visit my website, and you'll get my contact information. I'll be glad to sign you guys up. Perfect. So definitely find uh, you'll definitely sign up on the website, and 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 you'll find everything you need. Uh, and do join us next week, guys. We will be live with Kwan Segal, who's a very interesting woman from Thailand, who's in the U.S. and who got a job with no experience in the US. And our topic is going to be how to get a job with no experience. I saw some questions here on internships. This is exactly for you young folks, how to get a job with no experience. How do you sell yourself? And we're going to be talking about that. So um, with that, I want to say a big thank you to Matt for being with us today and for giving us your time. It's eight in the morning in Ohio. Uh, Matt's had a long night with his little one. So appreciate you taking the time. <laughs> 
out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks everyone for joining us. Take care of yourselves and we shall see you at the same time next week. Thank Bye. you. Bye.